Welcome to Westpac's Packaging Dynamics webinar entitled Extra Credit, Tricks of the Trade. I am Tim Eels and I will be your moderator and webinar organizer today. Last July when we concluded the webinar series with Packaging Dynamics number 5 on the design and testing of the protective package system, we thought we were done. But it turns out we were not. Herb decided the time was just right to share his tricks of the trade as it pertains to package design and test with you. This is a very special opportunity and we're glad that you're here with us today. Before we start on the webinar, I want to make sure that everyone is ready and familiar with the webinar control panel. There's a panel accessible by an orange button on the right upper left corner of your screen. And you can expand that by clicking the same button. You can submit questions on that pane um, using the chat pane near the bottom of the control panel. We'll be answering a few of the questions that you submit today during the webinar. If for some reason we're not able to address your specific question, Herb will follow up with you afterwards by email. Today's webinar and video um, and slide deck should be available on Westpac's website by Monday. With that, let's get started. Today's presenter is Herb Schunemann, the founder and chairman of Westpac. Herb is currently a lecturer at San Jose State University on the topic of package, packaging and package testing, and he's been doing it for 27 years. Herb, the audience awaits. It's all yours. And thank you, Tim, and I want to welcome all to this uh, uh, I think final uh, element in our package uh, dynamics webinar series. We started that in uh, January in this year, and as you can see, we've gone through all of the stages of uh, designing and testing a protector package system. Now, by popular demand, as Tim mentioned, we we'll offer you some tricks of the trade or tips and hints on how we actually use all this information that we presented. All of our webinars are available on the website, as Tim mentioned. Uh, under the resources tabs. Okay, so here's our agenda. Uh, it's a rather ambitious list of topics uh, that uh, I'd like to cover during this uh, next 55 minutes or so. Um, so with that ambitious list in front of us, fasten your seatbelts tightly and let's get started. Um, in the previous five webinars, we received we reviewed rather the history and the uh, terminology of packaging dynamics and paid special attention to uh, a single degree of freedom spring mass system. We used uh, that system to describe much of the dynamics involved in the uh, five-step procedure for a protective package design and testing. Uh, we also described the hazard elements of the distribution environment through which the packaged products must travel in order to get from uh, where you make them to your customer's location. Uh, for most products, this is the most hazardous portion of their entire life cycle. Central to our discussion of the uh, packaging dynamics concept is the idea of this uh, five-step procedure for protective package design and testing that we mentioned earlier. Uh, we also mentioned that there is a six-step procedure uh, politically named for convenience. For all practical purposes, they are identical. Uh, completion of these uh, five or six steps will result in, a, in an uh, optimum protective package design, assuming uh, things are all done uh, in an optimal fashion, of course. We hope that you will always remember this so-called uh, bar chart of protective package design and testing. This is a, a graphical representation designed to show that the product package system must have sufficient stamina to withstand the environment uh, distribution hazards. That is this bar right here, the third bar. So the product and package system must be of equal value to the inputs from the distribution environment. That's what it's designed to show. Okay. The reason for the bar char format is that each of these functions can be quantified, and that is exactly what we are attempting to do uh, with this uh, seminar series, namely uh, teach you how to quantify each of the bars in this chart. 
For example, in uh, webinar number two, we taught you how to quantify the distribution environment. Webinar number three, we taught you how to quantify uh, the product fragility and vibration sensitivity of the products. In webinar number four and five, we talked about the design of the package system so that the product and package together just meet what happens in the distribution environment. Uh, we also stated that if the package was suboptimum, there would be a gap, this gap right here, and we call that damage and shipment. If the package was over-designed, there would be waste, let's call it, and the waste is this section here, uh, and, and that is basically the result of an over-designed package system. I mentioned that there was also a six-step procedure, and that was uh, uh, characterized by this final bar where we can effectively increase the ruggedness of the product so that the package has a mm, less demanding job to do and should cost less in order that it also meet the exact requirements of the distribution environment. And that's the benefit of the bar chart. It puts all of those things together. So our goal is to design and test an optimum product package system in this fashion. Okay, well, let's get started. Uh, with these tricks of the trade and uh, um, make you all the black belt uh, package designers and testing testers in the process. The first question many people ask is, who does the best job of protective package design? I mean, I'm not going to make this my life's work, so who does this? Almost always we recommend the uh, package material suppliers because they seem to know mm, the best characteristics of the materials for sure if they sell them and the processes used to fabricate them, and you know the potholes to avoid, uh, and things like that. And they really do want to sell you something that is worthwhile. Uh, also, they are pretty good people to deal with most of the time. That's been my experience anyway. This is not an endorsement, only an observation after you know, many years in the business. So we do definitely recommend you talk to your protective package uh, designers, the people that sell the material. Many people ask, why can't I just follow your example and design the protective package myself? And the obvious answer is, you certainly can. But don't expect to produce an expert result the first time around. You may be quite surprised. Normally it takes a lot of trial and error to produce an optimized a protective package system. Another question we are often asked is, can I really trust a package vendor to give me the best possible answer? <laughs> my my answer to that is always look on the back of the dollar bill and what do you see <laughs> in God we trust all others pay cash so approach that one with caution okay on to tip number two for those of you with uh, heavier products to ship we highly recommend that you pay more attention maybe much more attention to vibration protection than to impact or shock protection. Why is this so? As you can see here, uh, impacts occur very infrequently for he uh, heavy products. I mean, it's common sense. It just takes too big a UPS gorilla to throw a 200 pound package. So it doesn't happen very often. What does happen is vibration because the heavier the product is, the more closely coupled it is to the vehicle on which it is traveling, and it is more likely to have a vibration-sensitive product within it. Heavier products generally have more vibration sensitivity. Coupled with this is the fact that vibration is an absolute certainty in the distribution environment because of the vehicles on which it travels. So unless your client is next door, you will be shipping something, and with a global distribution environment, that shipment might be a long ways away. But shocks during that, that, uh, that shipment are only a possibility. So we highly recommend designing for vibration first. Uh, in addition, if uh, designed incorrectly, a, a protective package system for a larger product can actually destroy the product inside. We've seen this happen many times. Uh, this happens when the package system amplifies vibration input at those frequencies where the product is most sensitive. Uh, for larger products, 
they often have sensitivities in the frequency range of the highest input from over the road trucks typically 10 to 18 Hertz so if you have a product that is sensitive in that range has a natural frequency at 14 Hertz for example and you have a package system that amplifies at 14 Hertz and you have trucks that put in the maximum amount of their energy at 14 Hertz you've got a system that will quickly destroy a product and that happens more frequently than not so pay attention to vibration for heavier products once you get the the hang of it and have the numbers designing for proper vibration attenuation is really quite simple and normally involves using less material than would otherwise be dictated by other approaches such as designing for shock protection for example most of the vibration corrections or modifications that we have done in our laboratory during actual tests involve removing material and thus making the package less expensive but certainly much more functional uh, it's also proven through statistics that much of the uh, so-called hidden damage during distribution results from poor vibration attenuation in the package system okay, okay on this tip number three which is shock pulse filtering and this whole area of filtering of uh, shock pulses is one that's uh, fraught with errors and misconceptions and misunderstandings uh, when you attach an accelerometer to a product and excite that product in some fashion such as a package drop test for example you will excite all of the frequencies uh, of the various spring mass systems within the product simultaneously most of these frequencies are relatively high and are not of much interest to the package designer proper filtering is an attempt to reduce the amplitude of these higher frequencies so that the lower frequencies produced by the cushion system for example can be identified and quantified in a reasonable and logical fashion that is why we call this a low pass filter we are attempting to pass through the lower frequencies while filtering out the higher frequencies okay. this uh, low pass filtering can be thought of as uh, passing a whole bunch of randomly sized rocks so-called random rocks over a small screen with a high pressure air blowing up through the screen high pressure air will blow away all of the smaller pebbles and the small rocks and only leave the bigger rocks in a similar way a low pass electronic filter will blow away essentially the higher frequencies and only leave the lower frequencies intact if this is done correctly the basic considerations or characteristics of the pulse are left intact while the superficial noise that we don't really want is removed again if this is done incorrectly the basic information we're looking for can be also destroyed uh, we have found that over the years uh, that a filter frequency of no lower than 10 times the pulse frequency will accomplish what we want without distorting the basic data we are looking for here you can see what can only be described as a very noisy shock pulse it's uh, virtually impossible to tell the basic amplitude of this pulse because of all the high frequency noise superimposed on the low frequency event the low frequency event can be considered the cushion this is a relatively common occurrence during a package performance drop test in these cases Here's an example of how the uh, 10x rule can be used. The uh, half sign pulse shown in the, the green with the green arrow above has a duration of uh, two milliseconds. That means the, that the actual period uh, of that particular event is two times the duration or four milliseconds. Uh, we know we covered this during our very first webinar on uh, terminology. We know that the frequency is the inverse of the period and in this case that winds up being a frequency of 250 Hertz 
which is 1 over divided by 0 0.004 seconds. Uh, if we applied the 10x rule to this situation, uh, the filter frequency would be 2500 hertz or 10 times 250 hertz. Filtering at a frequency lower uh, may distort the data uh, unacceptably. Filtering at a higher frequency would allow more noise to remain and thus distort the peak amplitude of the basic data we are looking for. So that is uh, the nuts and bolts of what we call the 10x rule. Again, uh, the, the uh, basic goal here is to be uh, more uh, accurate in quantifying the transmitted deceleration by removing the high frequency noise without distorting the uh, basic pulse itself, the pulse being the uh, cushion uh, input. Uh, in a classic study conducted about 20 years ago, we determined that the 10x pulse frequency rule would reduce pulse amplitude less than 10% on average, and we considered that to be acceptable. Filtering at something less than 10 times pulse frequency would normally produce unacceptable distortions of the basic data. Here is that uh, same noisy shock pulse that we saw previously, but this time it is properly filtered. So you can see the drastic difference. And you can also see that, well, there in fact is the actual pulse data uh, buried underneath all that high frequency stuff. That's the use, the proper use of filtering. So if you can distort the data, um, how can you tell if a shock pulse has been properly filtered? Okay. It's uh, actually relatively easy to identify an over-filtered uh, pulse, even if you do not have access to the filtering data. Anytime a shock pulse looks too clean, I'm going to call it, I, can, I tend to get very suspicious. The real world just isn't that way. There's almost always some wiggles and warts on a waveform when you're actually doing a real life product test. The second clue for over filtering is the tail on the end of the shock pulse itself. That's this area right here. So you can see that, that this is extended versus the, uh, the input portion of the pulse here. So anytime that, that the, the, the basic data is uh, distorted, near the decay portion of the pulse. That's what I, I'm referring to as having a tail on the pulse. This one isn't real obvious, but you can actually see it here. Okay. Then uh, the, uh, the, the, our, the, this result is an artificial extension of the time domain pulse resulting in this uh, tail that I referred to above. So that's, uh, that's a, a very clear giveaway that uh, the data was over filtered. Okay. On to topic number five, and or tip number five, and that is that the damage boundary is actually pretty conservative. So we've talked a lot of, in this webinar series about the damage boundary method for shock fragility assessment. It's a marvelous tool, and I have personally used it for over 40 years, and I love it, no question about it. But the simple fact is that it results in a very conservative estimate of product shock fragility. There are a number of reasons for this, but the most prominent is the use of the trapezoidal pulse for determining product critical acceleration. Careful analysis of this pulse shows that it will produce the maximum response in a spring mass system of any waveform with a comparable amplitude and duration. That is, it packs the highest punch for any waveform of similar duration and peak. You've probably seen this normalized uh, shock response spectrum plot before because people like me tend to use it a lot. Uh, this is a frequency domain representation of a time domain event. That means that the uh, horizontal axis is frequency based rather than time based. Okay? Um, it's actually the inverse of the uh, time domain itself. What it shows us is that the uh, spring mass system uh, any spring mass system will produce a response of twice the input when it is, it is excited by a square wave uh, and nearly that same level when excited by a trapezoidal pulse. You can see those differences right here. There's a square wave response, 
the trapezoidal response, and both of these are at two times the, uh, the, the response is twice the uh, acceleration input. Okay. When excited by a half sine or a sawtooth pulse, okay, the, uh, the response of the same spring mass system is always lower than that produced by the trapezoidal pulse okay, here. So you can see these responses are lower amplitude than the square or trapezoidal pulse, except at this one uh, frequency inflection point here where they all are approximately the same. Okay, and That one very narrowly de uh, defined point. So this is why the, uh, the, the, the basic reason why the trapezoidal pulse will actually produce the maximum response of any spring mass system, including your products. Uh, what this means is that the use of the trapezoidal pulse for acceleration testing is conservative. For example, if the trapezoidal uh, testing results in a, a product fragility estimate of 50 Gs, let's say, that same product could easily withstand a level of perhaps 55 to 60 Gs if the input pulse were a half sign rather than a trapezoid. During a package drop testing, the most common waveform by far can be described as a half sine pulse. During my 40 plus years of package drop testing, I've never seen a trapezoid waveform transmitted through a package cushion during a drop test. Okay? Almost always they can be described as half sine-ish. Also, the damage boundary test requires a series of stepped inputs uh, where you increase the acceleration level uh, for each step using this trapezoidal pulse. The result of this mm, stepped input is a type of low cycle fatigue uh, that will also cause failure at lower acceleration levels than would otherwise be the case. Okay? So if you step up a product acceleration level from 20 Gs to 30 and from 30 to 40 and 40 to 50, and, 40, and 50 to 60, and you finally saw a failure at 60, you'd back off to the 50 to describe its uh, critical acceleration. But if you took the same product and simply gave it uh, you know, 50 Gs or maybe even 60 Gs right off the bat, the chances are pretty good it wouldn't fail. So you have this slow cycle fatigue effect from the damage boundary test itself. So a good question to ask is, if the damage boundary is so conservative using the trapezoidal pulse, why do we use this for acceleration sensitivity testing? And there are three primary reasons for this. Um, number one, it's the best overall pulse for fragility analysis in spite of its drawbacks. Uh, and number two, it gives an absolute number for this uh, uh, for the fragility of the product, regardless of the pulse frequency or its shape which isn't the case for the other uh, wave shapes. And number three, eh, it's much easier and less expensive to program on a shock machine than half signs or sawtooth pulses. Um, modern trapezoidal pulse programmers are simply a, a cylinder with a piston on the top and you simply put high pressure nitrogen gas in there to change its characteristics. So it's easy to do. All you have to do is turn a valve. To make a different half sign, it requires changing out modules and impact buttresses and things like that, and it's tedious and time-consuming. And for a sawtooth pulse, up until recently, you had to cast lead cones, deformable cones that were only used once, and then they had to be recast. So by far, the trapezoidal pulse is easier to program and less expensive, even though it's more conservative. Okay, I've done a, a bunch of talking here, so it's time for any uh, any questions that may have developed during the first uh, half of this webinar. So, Tim, are there any uh, questions that I can address? Hey, thanks for asking, Herb. So far, the audience has been pretty quiet. I, I'm going to guess that they're awake and keeping good, good, paying good attention. Do you have any uh, comments that you'd like to add over the material that you've covered so far? Um, just one, and that was... Uh, in God we trust. I, I, I promise not to make any more jokes throughout the entire thing. I'm sorry. That was <laughs> somewhat uh, less than professional. But uh, um, we'll, we'll continue now and uh, get to the rest, have the rest of this because it's uh, the important stuff still to come. Okay, so let's continue. 
Okay, Herb, thank you. Okay, thank you, Tim. Moving right along, tick number six from our bag of tricks talks about uh, inform the information available in viewing a time domain waveform, particularly during a package drop test. There is a ton of information locked up in the shape of the wave, and it would be a good idea to learn a little of what it is telling us. The first thing you should note is that a properly uh, designed waveform uh, is symmetrically shaped, and in particular, the time from the zero point up to the peak, or the rise time of the pulse, is approximately equal to the decay time from that same peak back down to the zero or baseline. Okay. So that defines a, a, a properly loaded cushion system. Another piece of information available is the identification of an overloaded cushion. In this case, the rise time from the baseline to the peak okay, is very much greater than the decay time from the peak back to the zero point. Okay. You'll notice that these zero points are not at zero, they're at 10% of zero, which is the normal convection used convention used to define the base or time domain uh, function of a, of a wave pulse. Okay. Um, from a practical standpoint, this means the cushion is spending most of its time uh, deflecting and reaching a bottom or near bottoming situation before the energy of this event is fully dissipated. So what do I mean? This, this time, this extended time necessary, means that the, 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 the product package system is squeezing the cushion um, for most of, of that whole time period. So this overloaded cushion is an easy event to identify. The solution here is to add material in order to decrease the uh, the loading, the, the static stress loading, or perhaps uh, adding a thickness if you must. We'll talk more about that uh, in a little bit. Conversely, an underloaded cushion will have a very short rise time from the base to the peak okay, relative to the, the uh, decay time. Okay. From a practical standpoint, this means that uh, it's kind of like tossing a baby onto an extra firm mattress. Not that you'd ever do that, but imagine that you did. Uh, there is insufficient mass uh, to actually compress the spring or cushion, and the result is a relatively uh, rigid impact. This type of pulse is normally ac uh, uh, accompanied by extensive high-frequency noise. Uh, this stuff on the top of the pulse, for example, uh, sometimes referred to as ringing. The, the solution here is to remove material and to increase the loading on the cushion. Okay. All right, let's move on to uh, tip number seven that involves identification of a cushion that is uh, bottoming or overloaded. Uh, uh, this event will uh, almost always show up as a spike at the top of a waveform. If the spike occurs at the midpoint or later in the waveform, it indicates that the cushion is slight to moderately overloaded. If the spike occurs near the start of the waveform, the cushion is severely overloaded. Uh, the solution here is to add more material in order to reduce the loading or perhaps increase the cushion thickness. Refer to webinar number four on package design work for a simple formula to determine whether the problem is uh, overloading or if the cushion is uh, too thin. The, the waveform you see here shows the start of the waveform and then this spike, and the spike is kind of near the end. The waveform itself is about 14 milliseconds long. The spike occurs uh, probably in the neighborhood of uh, 9 to 10 milliseconds. So this would be considered a, a slightly overloaded cushion. As the, as the spike moves further and further toward the uh, beginning of the waveform, toward the rise, uh, rise portion, then the overloading or the bottoming is, gets to be more and more severe. So this would be considered a slightly uh, overloaded cushion and definitely bottomed in this particular area. 
So that's some of the things that you can learn. Tip number eight has to do with the difference between the input and the response uh, when measuring shock during a fragility test or a, a package drop test, for example. If you recall the uh, bar chart that we talked about earlier, okay, you will note that the uh, bar has a, a number three has the product and package system together right here and they must provide sufficient protection to endure the uh, ruggedness that is to uh, overcome the severe hazards input from the distribution environment during a package drought test it's a uh, very difficult to determine exactly uh, the line between these two that is what is actually being produced by the package and what is being produced by the product together okay <clears throat> So the difference between the uh, shock level that is transmitted through the cushion and into the product uh, and the uh, shock that is internally generated in the product itself. So that's that's the concern here and when I talk about input uh, versus response. Okay. This is a model that shows conceptually what happens during a package drop test. Uh, this model shows a, a product right here, okay, consisting of uh, uh, a number of internal components uh, that create this so-called complex spring mass system. We are attempting to measure or determine the level of shock uh, transmitted by the cushion okay, into the product in a, in a package drop test. To do this, we put an accelerometer right here okay, on a rigid portion of the product. Unfortunately, what we get is a combination of the input from the cushion here and a response of the product here. Okay. The, these are sometimes very difficult to separate. How in the world do you do that? Okay. This would be a relatively simple thing to filter out, except that the response of a spring mass system is always greater than the input. We saw that with the SRS plot earlier. This is exactly what the uh, so-called shock response spectrum analysis tells us. When we see this during a package drop test, the first reaction is to add more cushion thickness because we haven't got low enough deceleration levels or adjust the loading. Both of these uh, may result in a suboptimum package system. Okay, the result of this is waste of money for materials and especially logistics inefficiencies in distribution because if you add material, you're going to make the package bigger. Okay, this is a very common problem and uh, one that costs a lot of money. Okay. One of the solutions to this problem is something that I refer to as simultaneous input and response measurement or SIRM for short. I introduced this concept uh, about 15 or 20 years ago and no one paid any attention. <laughs> I guess it just wasn't sexy enough at that time. What this means is that during a product a shock fragility test uh, we measure both the input from the table right here uh, and as well as the response of the product shown here on this diagram. Many people would be surprised to know that these two numbers will be different. We use the shock input number here okay, uh, for our package design purposes. This becomes our shock fragility design level. We use the product response number from here okay, uh, to judge the pass-fail criteria during the, during the test. Okay. If you think about it, this makes sense. Unfortunately, it's a subtle difference. Uh, 
So that uh, tends to trip up many people and results in lots of sub-optimum uh, protective package design work. Well, I hope your trick bag is not full yet because we have two or three more to add to it. The next one we'll talk about is what's called the coefficient of restitution. This is the relationship between the rebound velocity and the impact velocity of any shock event. During a package impact, for example, a certain amount of energy is stored in the cushion. Uh, during the rebound, a certain amount of that energy is either dissipated or transmitted back to the product. The ratio of these two is referred to as the coefficient of restitution, or what we call E. Note that this is uh, very different than the total velocity change, which is equal to the impact plus the rebound velocity of any shock event. During package design, our goal is to limit the total energy delivered to the product, not just the peak acceleration. Generally speaking, a cushion that limits total velocity change during an impact is more desirable than one that doesn't. That is, uh, it delivers less total energy back to the product uh, during an ex excitation, such as a drop or impact during distribution. Okay. Cushions that store most of their energy uh, and deliver back some of it to the product are referred to as full rebounding cushions. Closed cell polyethylene foam is a good example of this. Cushions uh, that uh, deform or change their shape during an excitation are referred to as non rebounding or deformable cushion shapes. Molded pulp and similar designs are good examples of this. So here's a design example that shows the difference in the coefficient of restitution of the two different cushion systems. Um, suppose a package drop height of 30 inches is, is examined. Uh, in this particular case, a G is the gravitational constant and H is the drop height. So the impact velocity is equal to the square root of 2GH. Okay. So the impact velocity from a 30 inch free fall is 132, 152 rather, inches per second. Uh, if the coefficient of restitution of this system is 0.8, then the total energy delivered to the product is uh, 1.8 times 152 or 274 inches per second. Okay. On the other hand, if a crushable cushion system were used with a coefficient of restitution of perhaps 0.2, then the total velocity change to the product during that same event, a 30 inch drop, would be about 182 inches per second, uh, which is 1.2 times the impact velocity, 152. That's a much lower value. So the question is, what you'd rather have, 272 or 182 uh, inches per second velocity change? Think of it as energy content delivered to your product. It doesn't take much of a genius to figure out that 0.2 is a better number. There are some other issues involved in this such as what happens for the next impact when you have a, uh, a crushable system. Okay? And those are valid concerns. All I'm saying here is that the coefficient of restitution will tell you uh, whether or not you have a concern in that regard or not. Okay? All right, moving right along. Tip number 10 in our bag of trips, uh, tricks has to do with uh, non-linear cushion designs. Uh, you have heard us talking about these designs, unless you've been asleep, of course, uh, when we discuss cushion ribs during the webinars number four and five. Uh, it's good to define some basic terms before we begin uh, explaining this. First of all, what the heck is a linear spring? And a linear spring, or cushion in this case, is one whose force versus deflection characteristics are a straight line. That, that is, if I apply a certain amount of force, I get a corresponding amount of deflection. If I double the force, I double the deflection. That is defined as a linear spring. This is the linear line that results from the force deflection curve. It doesn't matter if it's in the middle as long as it's a straight line. That defines a linear cushion. 
A nonlinear spring or cushion is one whose force versus deflection characteristics are nonlinear. That is to say, doubling the force on the spring will not necessarily double the deflection. In particular, cushions that are referred to as hardening springs have a higher degree of deflection at lower force levels than they do at higher force levels. This winds up being a very desirable characteristic because uh, vibration requirements, for example, can be taken care of at the low deflection range of this spring because the force levels are relatively low. Typical G levels for vibration on a truck are well below one. Shock inputs can be uh, a comp uh, uh, accompanied or accomplished, uh, taken care of rather, during the high deflection range because the cushion will absorb uh, a, a greater amount of force for the same incremental amount of deflection. So nonlinear cushions are very desirable. You can see here the uh, nonlinear portion of this particular plot versus the linear portion of a linear spring. Okay, so perfectly clear, right? <laughs> Probably not. Uh, the simple fact is that nonlinear cushions are difficult to design from an engineering standpoint. Uh, recent improvements in computer programs have offered a lot of improvements in this area, but the designs can be relatively complex and straight and you know, expensive. Uh, these type of springs are often found on reusable crating systems. Uh, coiled rope wires, for example, is a good example, because they're very effective. About 15 years ago, several large computer companies, I won't name them here, uh, began extensively investigating nonlinear cushion designs because they thought there would be a considerable competitive advantage to using them on their large hardware. As it turns out, most of these benefits can be approached by the use of ribs using traditional cushion materials. And that's exactly what we recommend. Don't buy any expensive programs to do this. Simply investigate how you can design better uh, protective package cushions with ribs. You've all seen this picture sequence before, and it shows two different polyethylene foam cushions. The one on the left here <laughs> shows the use of ribs in a very effective manner. Okay. Uh, essentially creating a nonlinear cushion design. The example on the right, over here, uses the same material, but in a linear fashion, resulting in normally less effective uh, cushion systems. By the way, those of you who have heard me talk about avoidance of void corners in cushion work, some people have asked what I meant by that comment. The design on the right has void corners, right here. Nothing in the corners, okay? So those are the, what I refer to as void corners, okay? Design on the, on, the, uh, uh, on the left here has material in the corners, supplemental material generally added in the corners. It's hard to see in this particular design, but there's material in the corners, and that avoids what I call void corners. I hope that uh, better explains what I was talking about. And here we have it, the last of the tips in my bag of tips. I call this Herb's Super Secret 7 Protective Package Design Steps. And I'll say that quick, five times in a row. Over the years, I've used these uh, steps successfully, and normally in the, uh, in the sequence shown, to create the best package designs that I am capable of. I offer them here for your consideration. So the first one is simply establish the required deflection. That comes from the uh, delta x equals uh, 2h over g minus 2 formula. Look at uh, uh, webinar number 3 for that. The second one is to establish the required cushion thickness from the cushion efficiency data, also from webinar number 3. The third step I use is to use this uh, static stress loading uh, to be optimum for vibration first. Uh, and then for a shock afterwards. And then I uh, design uh, for fabrication efficiencies uh, as best I can using the chosen material process 
processes and locations. And by locations, I mean I don't uh, specify a given material if it's not available there. Uh, urethane cushions, for example, used to be readily available on the west coast of the United States, but virtually nowhere else. So if I designed a urethane cushion system and the product uh, was used to move to Atlanta for, uh, for fabrication, it was very inefficient because they had to ship the cushions from California. Also, use ribs whenever possible uh, for the reasons given, nonlinear cushion design, and then avoid the void corners, as I just explained. Step five is fabricate the prototype uh, package system. Okay. And then number six, document that. I, I find that if I don't document that quickly, I often lose it. And then step seven is you simply test the design for vibration first. I always use vibration first. And then impact. Why vibration first? Well, impact normally creates some denting of the cushion system or some uh, more or less permanent deformation. And I want to find out what the, the uh, cushion material will do before that uh, from the vibration. Uh, for impacts, I always recommend to test the failure uh, for, for so-called margin analysis. And then I use the SIRM uh, techniques where I will accept the response from the fragility test as the pass, passing uh, criteria for the uh, package drop testing. So that's Herb's super secret seven tips. Okay. Uh, I should emphasize that uh, um, other people do their protective package design work differently and they may produce equal or even better results. The steps I've shown previously are simply the ones that work well for me. I do not want to emphasize uh, uh, the, the I don't want to de-emphasize the importance of uh, margin testing. That is, don't just drop a package and collect the data. Drop it till it fails, and then you know how much headspace or margin is available in that design. You may be surprised. I've had margins of over 200% when I didn't think they existed at all. Finally, don't be disappointed or deterred if your initial package design does not meet all the requirements initially. I've never had a design that was optimum the first time around. Redesign and retesting is a way of life in this business, so don't think that a poor performance is initially a failure. It's just the first step in the design process. Okay. During the course of the previous five webinars on protective package design, people have asked interesting and informative questions, and I put some of them here uh, so that uh, everyone can benefit from them. Uh, I'll read them quickly, and uh, depending on the amount of time we have available, uh, the, the first one is how much headspace is uh, appropriate for a perfection design, and I say I shoot for zero. Uh, and the reason is there's so much conservatism built into the test that I don't think I need extra margin. Uh, what steps you use for designing a, a crushable system? And basically, I use the same steps I outlined previously. I simply adjust the stiffness and the uh, depth of the ribs based on the test results. Uh, why don't cushion material suppliers furnish vibration data? Eh. Because we don't demand it. I mean, if everyone demanded it, they would certainly produce it. Guaranteed. Um, how does one determine the maximum uh, product deceleration levels and resonant frequency information? Well, that's exactly what we referred to in webinar number three on product fragility analysis. So I would refer you back there. Here's an interesting question. Does the weight of a product affect uh, the test parameters, particularly the use of a trapezoidal pulse for acceleration testing? And the answer is no. The weight of the product does not affect the test procedures at all. It certainly does affect the equipment utilized. If you have a, a two or three or 5,000 pound product, you're gonna to have to have a huge shock machine to, to test it on, but you'll use the exact same procedures. A question about void corners. I hope I answered that. Uh, some of the rib shapes uh, that you saw seem to be fairly narrow. Are you concerned about buckling? And the answer is, yep, I sure am. Anytime that you have a, uh, a height of a cushion that exceeds the length of the whip, or the width, I'm sorry, uh, you're liable to have column buckling, and that's a problem. So don't don't do that. Keep the uh, keep the height uh, less than the length or the width. Okay. Where does one find reliable cushion curves and vibration data? Well, from the material suppliers, and you should demand it. 
Uh, there was also a question that uh, about they'd like to see a webinar that discusses all of Westpac's test devices and their capabilities. And uh, my response is, thanks. I'll visit our website and you'll see a lot of it there. Or call us and arrange a tour. We'd be happy to show you around. We have absolutely nothing to hide and we'd like, like to talk to people. And finally, where did you get all this information about packaging dynamics? And I said, well, it comes with gray hairs and wrinkles. And then besides, we make that our business. So that's where it comes from. So, Tim, that's uh, I think that, that's uh, all we have for right now. Are there any questions that I can answer? Hey there, Herb. Yes, we do have some questions. Let's see. Um, one question came from Lewis. And Lewis wanted to know why a coefficient of restitution of 0.2 is better than 0.8? That's a good question. Uh, and basically, it, it, it comes down to the fact that um, the uh, the total energy, it's not really energy, but you can think of it that way, uh, delivered uh, to a product during an impact is equal to the impact plus the rebound. Well, a coefficient of restitution of 2 means it doesn't have much of a rebound. It doesn't, doesn't, re it doesn't uh, rebound at all. Again, it's, think of it that, uh, from the same height. Well, you'd much rather fall into something where you just go in there and stick. And that's what the coefficient of restitution of 0.2 is all about. Tim, any other questions? Let's see, there's one uh, question about, we have one question here about, uh, let's see, impact testing and vibration testing. Here's the question. What issues are caused if impact test is done first, followed by a vibration? That's a good question, and it's a very practical one. Uh, during a, a, um, an impact test, um, the cushion uh, is very highly stressed almost always. Uh, you, you, you try to stress it at its maximum point. And in so doing, it's likely to change its uh, rebounding characteristic, especially if it's a non-rebounding cushion. There's very few of them where you can impact them severely and they come back the same way. Vibration, on the other hand, uh, is a very mild stress level. The only thing we're really concerned about in vibration is the resonant frequency uh, and to a lesser extent the uh, transmissibility, but mostly just the, the, the frequency. Where does it uh, where does it resonate? So you want to get that data first while the cushion is still intact. Uh, it hasn't been distorted or compressed or anything like that. So always do that first, then do the impacts, and that's the reason why. Uh, Tim, any anything else? I guess we do here. We have one from Tim, and Tim asks us if we can pick out buckling conditions from the shock pulse data. Um, perhaps you could. Um, it, it would be a, a funny rise time on the pulse that would, uh, you know, dip down and, and have a distinct dip where the uh, the, the buckling started to occur. Um, it would it would be a little uh, little, little tenuous to do that. But I bet you know if uh, if you saw enough of them, you could probably do it. Probably not the first time, but I think you you actually could. It would be difficult though. So that's kind of a non-answer, but that's that's kind of how we're looking at them. Uh, Tim, anything else? Uh, there's another one, Herb. This is an easy one. It, kind of regarding uh, Westpac test reports. The question was, during the uh, on, as part of the report, would we report um, either an overloaded or underloaded cushion? Uh, the answer to that question is normally yes, uh, because uh, the whole purpose of a test is to find out what's going on. And uh, if we see something, uh, such as an overloaded or underloaded cushion, depending on the shape of the waveform, um, our engineers are trained to let that be known. And typically, we have either the comments or the conclusion section of report, and you should look for it there. But the answer is yes, we, we would definitely let you know if we thought the cushion were overloaded or underloaded. Tim, anything else? Sure, Herb. Here's one last one, and this is regarding finite elemental analysis. Uh, Kyle asks, what are your feelings on using FEA in the design process? 
Uh, real good question, Kyle. Uh, finite element analysis is uh, basically an attempt to look at the dynamics of a, of a system um, from on a computer program. And if you know all of the elements of, of the product and especially of the cushion system itself, um, you in fact can do that. Um, there have been some attempts at trying to design uh, protector package systems using uh, FEA, finite element analysis, uh, and similar programs. To the best of my knowledge, none of them have been successful or have been released commercially on the marketplace as yet. I'm not sure whether the application is, is the right one or not, or, or I'm not sure why. Uh, it, it, on the surface, it's a good application. There was a project at Michigan State University, hmm, probably between five and ten years ago to look at exactly that and they reported back that it wasn't a good application because they couldn't account for the heat uh, build up in the cushion system. I'm not sure whether that was a you know just a funny way of getting out of the research or whether it was actually true because I haven't really uh, investigated that but excellent uh, excellent question. I think that's how packages will be designed in the future. It just hasn't come, come about as yet. Uh, Tim anything else? Well, thanks, Herb. It looks like we're running short on time, so we better uh, get the train rolling down the tracks here. Okay, thank you, Tim. Uh, we hope this uh, series of presentations has been interesting, informative, and helpful. It's important to recognize that this is the uh, essence of a university-level class on protective package design. Both Edmund Tang, uh, who assisted in the previous webinars, and I have taught classes like this for more than 30 years at San Jose State University. Uh, we learned from some of the best in the business, such as Dr. George Marcondes, Dr. Robert Newton, Mr. Bill Kipp, Mr. Dennis Young, Mr. Steve Pierce, and lots of others too numerous to mention and to thank. Our sincere hope is that you will benefit from these tips as well as the uh, webinar presentations themselves and are able to uh, produce better and more efficient protective packages uh, because of this. If you would like more information on this or any other topic related to testing of products or package systems, please feel free to contact us at the San Jose or San Diego laboratory locations shown here. Also, please visit our website frequently because we often add helpful information on a regular basis. Okay, Tim, could you tell us what's next in our webinar series? Absolutely, Herb. Um, our, web, our next webinar will review the packaging requirements for hazardous materials and dangerous goods as mandated by the DOT in the U.S. And, and the United Nations worldwide. This webinar will provide participants with a good overview of the Code of Federal Regulations, types of packaging typically used, um, but most of all how to get your package system certified and properly labeled so you'll be in compliance. That webinar is going to occur on Thursday, November 19th. So those of you who are interested in that, uh, you'll find an invitation in your inbox in a couple of weeks, or you can go to our, west, our website on the Resources Webinar tab and find an invitation there. It'll be posted on Monday. If you missed anything today or you'd like to uh, listen to the webinar again or share it with your colleagues, uh, you could visit uh, Westpac's uh, website and um, a video of the webinar and the slide deck from today will be uploaded by Monday next week. We'll be sending you a short survey in just in a few minutes. We hope you'll take a moment to fill it out. We really value your opinion and most of all your suggestions on how to make this webinar better and those in the future. You'll have an opportunity to ask questions uh, following today's webinar that you might come up with or suggest a new topic. I want to thank you all for attending today. I am Tim Eels. Make it a great day.